You are listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast with Maggie Green, episode number 282. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast, a podcast that celebrates cookbook readers, buyers, collectors, writers, and clubs. And now your host, cookbook author, culinary dietitian, and cookbook writing coach, Maggie Green. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. How is everybody doing today? Hope you're all having a great day. And as always, I'm excited to be here. I want to thank you all for being here. And hey, if you know someone who loves cookbooks or is thinking about even writing a book of their own, maybe even a cookbook, share the podcast with them. Let them know about Cookbook Love. One of the things that helps the word to spread about cookbooks and podcasts like this is if you share it with a friend. So I would greatly appreciate that. Today on the podcast, I have an interview with Kat Ashmore. Kat is the digital creator behind Cat Can Cook. Before becoming a TikTok sensation, Kat graduated from the Institute of Culinary Education in New York City. She then worked for Martha Stewart, developing recipes and producing cooking segments for the Martha Stewart Show. Kat is known for her skillful ability to incorporate clever food hacks and tips into fun, simple, and delicious recipes that just happen to be healthy, too. Kat's real-life, authentic, unfussy approach and relatability have created a community of enthusiastic home cooks. Today on the podcast, Kat and I talk about her journey from Martha Stewart to her first cookbook, Big Bites, as well as her journey through food media on the camera and off. So without further delay, let's dive into this interview with Kat Ashmore. Hi, Kat. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast. Hi there. So great to be here. So excited that you're here kicking off 2024 with some beautiful new cookbooks and your new release uh, book called Big Bites. But before we talk about the book, why don't we have everybody uh, learn a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Great. I um, I am a content creator, food blogger, very soon to be, um, hopefully multiple cookbook author. <laughs> hopefully this is one of many. That's the plan. I've waited it feels like a long time to write a cookbook. Um, I really wanted to wait until it felt like it was the right time. And I was very clear about what I could add to the space and why people should buy my cookbook when there are already so many fabulous ones out there. Um, I went to culinary school in my late 20s after having worked in marketing. And after culinary school, I went on to work for Martha Stewart, both on the TV production side of the Martha show and also on the corporate side in recipe development and product development. Um, And from there, I went up to Indigo in Canada and I headed up their specialty food section and was involved with the cookbooks up there. So cookbooks have been very much part of my life personally and professionally for a very long time. And I launched my own business in 2020. So um, it'll be about, yeah, it'll be four years this summer. Wow. You launched during the pandemic. I did. I did a few months in. Yes. You know, it doesn't, it seem so funny that that was four years ago. It does. It feel it, it, it does. It feels, I mean, I came across, we recently moved house and I came across probably four or five boxes of masks. And I was like, Oh, I re- <laughs> wow. I remember. Th- yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that was I, the thing. <laughs> it was. And you know, I think time is such a funny thing. It seemed like in the midst of that, somehow it kind of like just crept along and then crept along 2021. 20, and now here we are a um, whole new year. And um, I think we've all obviously learned a lot from that, but what was it like start? What did you, what did you do when you started your own business and um, what had you been doing? I think everybody's probably curious too about what you did with Martha Stewart, the kinds of work that you did with her and the uh, program that she had and um, the work that you did and how that led into the work that you started to do when you opened your own business. When, so when I was at Martha, I had 
I was graduating culinary school. I went to the Institute of Culinary Education in Chelsea in New York City. And there was an externship program that was the last leg of our training there where we had hands-on experience. And the chefs really highly suggested that we go to a restaurant to get the hands-on experience in a restaurant. My instincts, I don't know if I felt like, you know, I'm almost 30 years old. I am too old for that kind of lifestyle because I had waited tables and things yeah. like that in college. And I knew what that, what that type of life was like. And um, I just, my instincts were telling me, go get experience in the field you want to be in, which was food media. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a number of different interviews at various places from Bon Appetit to Sever and Rachel Ray and Martha. And I had, you know, Martha was very much an idol of mine since yeah. I was a child. I used to go on vacation and I would take, I would read cookbooks like novels yeah. at night and I would take her entertaining cookbook with me in like seventh grade on, yeah. you know, and we would be on vacation and my brother would be like, Kathleen, what are you doing? There's no <laughs> kitchen. You're not cooking anything. We don't have a kitchen to cook, but I would read it like a novel because yeah. to me it, you know, they are stories and they are stories that always end well, which is hard to find. Uh, so, I agree. That's a great way to think about it. They do. Yeah. Yeah, they are. For me, I can sit down and I can flip through. I I, I mean, I see and I understand that you have yeah. a ton of cookbooks. I of have course. a lot of cookbooks. And it's funny you mentioned entertaining because when I first got married, my mother-in-law gave me a copy of that book for Christmas. And uh, mm -hmm. they lived in the same town as my parents lived. And we had a lot of family parties and things to do that Christmas. And I sat like every minute I could sit and just read and looked at every single picture and read that whole book from cover yeah. to cover. And that was really one of Martha's, I think, I'm not, I don't know if I'm wrong, but one of her first, first. published books mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because sure she was. was a caterer. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yes. Yes. She started off in, in catering and I, uh, I had always, I mean, as soon as I stepped onto the backstage of the show and was doing my interviews, it was so clear to me, you know, this is where I want to be. Yeah. yeah. And I and think so. You, yeah. You know that when you land in a place like that, that this is exactly yeah. what I'm supposed to be doing. A hundred percent. And so I, when I was offered the position there, it was very surreal and it stayed surreal for quite some time. Um, but I was involved in all of the food segments. So anytime that Martha was cooking on stage with you know, whether it was chefs, uh, cookbook authors, audience members, celebrities. I also did some uh, work in front of the camera mm -hmm. as well. Things like Thanksgiving hotlines and a little bit of cooking and that sort of thing. Um, I think that that certainly prepared me to be doing what I'm doing now. And yeah. is probably a big part of the reason that I don't get nervous really when I'm doing live television and things like that is because I did have that experience. So I was really thrown in the fire and I grew a backbone through that experience. Uh, as you can imagine, it was, the standards are incredibly high yeah. and it was, I mean, it was an unbelievable experience. We got to really be at the cutting edge of what types of issues in the food world mattered to people uh -huh. around the country and meet unbelievable, you know, unbelievable chefs. And I often say that, you know, we would have people like Hugh Jackman and Katie Holmes and Julie Andrews on the show. And, but when Thomas Keller got out of his black car, that was the only time that I was starstruck. I, I can just, imagine. The presence of yeah. his genius was yeah. enormous. Yeah. So that was, Fantastic. And I was very grateful that I had gone to culinary school because I had really learned the language to yeah. be able to speak with these chefs about food in a really technical way. Yeah. And I think uh, culinary experience, it can lead you to a restaurant, but there's a lot of other places it can lead you also. And obviously for you, you landed mm -hmm. at Martha, you learned so much. And then you you made some you made some changes and you decided to move on. But what did you take from Martha to the next step? Other than the not afraid of being on camera, talking into a, you know, a camera is a funny thing, isn't it? It's like it this is. little portal that you don't see anybody on the other end. 
Mm -mm. It's Martha, really, it Martha's really shows like weren't live way. audience. Were they? They weren't live <laughs> audience, were they? Martha's shows? Yes. They were? So, I guess yep. I thought that they were all just recorded. So we had two shows a day and the morning show was at 10 a.m. And that was our live show. And oh, then okay. 2 p.m. was our recorded okay. show. Okay. All right. So they were both. But yeah, when you don't yeah. see anybody on the other end of the camera and you're really just talking and you know, looking at the camera, it's like. Yeah, it feels very much like a one way conversation. It really does. In that sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think a, a couple of the things that I really learned from Martha and from my time there. Number one, just learning from Martha that she often says, when you're through changing, you're through. That's sort of her tagline. And she is someone that you have seen. I mean, she has evolved so many times throughout mm -hmm. her career. And she's very nimble and she's very curious. And she will enter into all different kinds of spaces, join all different kinds of platforms, you know, be on the cover of <laughs> Sports Illustrated. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot that she won't explore. And so that was really interesting for me to get to get to experience firsthand. And I think also I learned that you need to lead with a point of view in this industry. You can change your point of view, but you've got to have a point of view because if you don't, you will get walked over. And living in a place like New York City, working for someone like Martha Stewart, if you didn't have an opinion, if you didn't have something to add to the conversation, you, you cease to exist in that project. So um, I think that is something that I have taken to heart in my own business and the conversations hmm. that I have with my own communities is sort of a strong opinions, loosely held approach where I am very much a student in my life and I'm always learning more and not being afraid to speak on something if you yeah. don't know everything. Yeah. You know, I, sometimes people won't speak or they get paralyzed because they think they have to know everything before Often. they actually can talk. And that really doesn't serve us well because we, our point of view matters. Our point of view matters a lot. And often it's the people that are the loudest that know the, know the least. So I think, <laughs> I think we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to everyone around us to take part in the conversation. And it's really about the approach you have, right? Yeah. Of coming from a place of curiosity rather than judgment. Yeah. I think as women, especially, that's yeah. something that's really, that's been really big for me. Yeah. Well, good. That's great. And that led you then into starting your own work, opening your own mm -hmm. business during 2020. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that. What did you do and what did you segue into? Sure. So I had been, I was a stay-at-home mom in 2020. I had a one and a three-year-old and we had moved out to Connecticut and we had chosen my husband and I, and I, you know, I use the quotation marks because really it didn't feel like much of a choice. And I know that a lot of women experience this, but my career doesn't exist in Connecticut. It doesn't exist in the suburbs. So if I were to continue working after having children, I would be commuting into New York, which it might have been fine to do, except my husband was also commuting into New York. So that basically meant neither one of us would see our child in yeah. the morning or at night. So we yeah. would have weekends mm -hmm. with him. Right. And that just didn't feel like an acceptable yeah. deal for us. So it seemed like, okay, I guess I'm going to stay home. And I think a lot of women, they, they have to contend with the cost of childcare, versus their wages. And, you know, I can't, I don't really want to lose money to go back to work and do something really, you know, creative and fun and light and soul fulfilling in the suburbs. But, you know, it just, it didn't seem like something that I really had much of a choice with. And after a few years, after I had my daughter, she was one, my son was three it had become more increasingly clear to me that I was a pretty rubbish stay-at-home mom. I think when you're a creative, you can only keep it inside for so long. And then it, it's like having a new puppy. It needs to be exercised yeah. or else it can cause, it can get in a lot of trouble. And mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, the pandemic happened. And I think what happened for me and is the case for probably many people Suddenly, you weren't going out, you weren't distracting yourself. So maybe something 
that was going on inside of you that you were trying not to pay attention to started rising to the surface because there was space for it. And, you know, it just so happened that I was invited. I have a girlfriend that I had gone to college with that had done this cycle of a TikTok program. So TikTok was at a stage in spring 2020 when they were looking at reinventing their image within the public eye. They already had a number of very well-renowned educators and experts on the platform doing really great work, but people still looked at it as an app where kids are dancing. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. And some people still do. Okay. So there are a few people that are like, Oh, isn't that that?" I'm like, it's a little more than that. Uh, So I had been invited to take place in this program. It was a creator program around education. And I just said, yes. And that was something I think I also learned from my time at Martha Stewart. Just you say yes, and you figure it out later. So I said, yes. And one of the requirements was that I needed to post a video a day. And so I very much have honed my my voice and my approach and my belief system and really what my value is by just doing it. If I had waited until I, kn- I knew what I wanted to say, I wouldn't have started. Right. So the actual honing of all of this came through your experience of actually doing the videos every day. Very much so. I have right. to... I'm so I have to act my way into yeah. <laughs> it. I can't think my way into it. You know, the time is never right. There are yes. always reasons not to. Right. So I um I you know the the one thing is that I have remained very consistent and been very open to listening to what people wanted to see from me. And I think I started out in 2020 having a real idea of what I felt like people should want to see from me. And over time, I switched my approach to just going like, forget about what I think, you know, what are the problems you're having? Mm-hmm. How can I meet you where you are? And we can take this journey together. Yeah. And what did you hear from your audience? I heard time and time again, that there that there are hangups around eating better, around cooking more, around eating more whole foods, whether it's financial time always, right? Money and time were the two things we can never have enough of. So I really worked in some ways, I don't want to say unlearn some of my Martha Stewart ways, but, you know, kind of get, have a much more casual approach to it and have, you really meet them where they are and have that gray space where, we could kind of talk about, and I talk about it a lot. You know, my daughter would prefer box macaroni and cheese yeah. to my homemade macaroni and cheese. Yeah. It's just the way it is. You know, she's a five-year-old. So we're going to work with that, you know? And so I think that that type of approach, I often say, I take my food seriously. I don't take myself too seriously. Just having it feel casual and fun and offer, offering some entertainment while still delivering really solid recipes and techniques. Um, was something that people seem to have a real appetite for. Yeah, I have to tell you, I read your acknowledgments um, in your new book, and you get, there's a paragraph there about you know different people that helped you along the way. But the paragraph you wrote for your mother, I thought was very touching, because mm-hmm. you talked and you referred to the things that you did with her around a table. You mentioned a picnic table. You mentioned the family mm-hmm. table. Maybe if you were at the beach, um, just experiences you had with her in the kitchen. But she should always say at the end. Uh, Kat, thank you for helping me. I probably could have uh, finished this in half the time if you hadn't have been here. Yes. So yeah. I think she I brought could have a done spirit in, in of this fun, this fun and joy with her personality into your experience in the kitchen with her when you were a child. And um, I think that that attitude, carrying that through to not taking ourselves so seriously, even when we're cooking at home, is especially when we have kids, is huge. <laughs> Huge. I think you're right. I think you make a great point. I think that that's a lot of it. I mean, my kids enjoy being in the kitchen with me because 
you know, I'll crack an egg on my head. I'll let them crack an egg right. on their head. It's not, right. you know. I, and I think I as women, we're them. often like caught between this thing. We're wanting to eat well for our own bodies, our own, you know, making sure we're eating healthy. And then having these little kids that just, they would really probably do anything in the kitchen with us that we would let them do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of it for me has been about loosening the stress, loosening the idea of perfection, making it fun. Right. It, I won't say it was the easiest thing in the world for me. I mean, of course, but I come from a highly produced right. atmosphere. Right, right, right. So, in the, your kitchen at home is not Mar- it's not the Martha show. No, definitely it's not. It's like pots and pans maybe on the floor and, you know, yeah. noise and mess mm-hmm. and whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And surprisingly to me, that I think is a lot of why it resonates with yeah. people. You know, right. half the time I have salad dressing in my hair or, <laughs> you know, and I make a joke about these things. You know, some of my, my community will ask me, what do I do if I get garlic smell on my hands? And I'm like, yeah. you, you might not like garlic. If you, if you're that concerned about smelling like garlic, like it's all good. I just yeah. have, I have the attitude of, you roll with it. It's all good, you know, and just make it fun. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we kind of led to this conversation, but was that the point of view that you actually ended up taking then with this work that you were doing on TikTok after talking to your audience? Yes. Yeah. Very, very much so. I think also approaching, how, because I was going through my own health journey, I would call it after having kids and wanting to, you know, shed some of the weight that I had gained, have more energy, drink less alcohol, just the whole thing. And so as I was going on this journey with myself, I was bringing everyone along with me. So in no way, and I think people feel that I'm not talking to people from a soapbox. I am very much like we are in this together Mm -hmm. and I might be just a couple steps ahead of you. And I'm going to share what i found and what I'm, what I'm experiencing. And as someone who obviously loves food, went to culinary school, has made a career out of it. The idea of depriving myself or, you know, sticking to some kind of rigid meal plan would never work for me. I am about abundance and big flavors and how can you marry that with also, you know, a lot of great nutritional components too. Right. So that led to something that went viral for you on TikTok. Tell us about that. Oh, the hungry lady salads. And it's so funny because when I called my first, the first salad that I just sort of casually called a hungry lady salad, you never really know what is going to catch on. Um, it, it went crazy. And, you know, I said, these are meal in a bowl salads that actually fill you up. Like these are salads that you can oftentimes make on a Sunday you have it ready to go for the rest of the week. Your time is really valuable. Oftentimes we don't make the most mindful choices when we're in a rush, when we're overly hungry. So they're really satiating and they're exciting. You know, they aren't sad salads. We're not talking (laughs) about, you know, a crouton and a piece of iceberg here. So people just resonated with that so much. And I had my entire, I had my blog posts already locked and loaded. I had all of these videos shot to share in January and I threw out my whole content plan and I said, okay, I guess we're making this a series. And that's so I you, think that yeah. that's been a big part of it is, yeah. is being nimble and being able to pivot and really listening to people and saying, okay, there's something here. They're telling me that they need this kind of thing. And in January, when the new year, new you conversation is so prevalent, I felt like there weren't a lot of places to go if you didn't fit into a pretty rigid dietary box. If you weren't like, if you were paleo, if you were vegan, if you were whatever it was, there were somewhere you knew you could find websites and blogs, but for all the people that just kind of wanted to eat better, where do they go? Yeah. You know? And so I wanted to give them a place to come. Yeah. And, um, the hungry lady salads led to like Martha taught you just, if you're not changing, if you're through changing, you're through you're and through. you had the courage to just say, okay, I'm going to go with this. And how, tell us about the trajectory of that. What happened with hungry lady salads after you just decided I'm going to lean into this? They continued 
I mean, it was like almost every post I would do would go viral. And then I posted a video sort of talking about my philosophy around food and the abundance and the flavor forward notes of, of the food. And it just resonated so much. I gained a crazy amount of followers from that and started getting all of these messages. I mean, I, I get them very regularly now from people saying how much I've helped them heal their relationship with food and women whose daughters, you know, have struggled with eating disorders or whatever it is that, you know, they consider my food safe, but it's also very big and nutritious. And it's like this, this place where so many different kinds of people can meet. And I even got this, I got this message. You'll get a kick out of this. I got a message about six months ago from a woman in New Zealand who's father, 62 year old father was going on a guy's fishing trip and had brought one of my hungry lady salads like as his <laughs> contribution. And I am just racking up, like just right. picturing this, so you know, sweet though, it, like, isn't it? Group of men in New yes. Zealand on this fishing trip, eating a hungry lady salad. And yes. that is exactly the magic of these, right? Is right. that it's this place that we can all come together. Yeah. How did it feel to have personally created that through your own ingenuity and not through something like the Martha show? Incredible. Yeah. It was very validating. It was very validating for me because it isn't something that I feel like has been done before with such intention, at least that I've received. Right. And I think that there have been some risks associated with it, certainly. Um, you know, I mean, on social media, you'll get all kinds of opinions about all kinds of things. And sometimes playing it safe can feel very appealing. Uh, but I think when you don't, and when you're not afraid to really step out and talk about your philosophy around the why of what you're doing, instead of just posting recipes, because I felt like the only unique thing about the food that I'm doing, I mean, yes, maybe the recipes are a bit different than some other recipes, but the most unique thing is that I'm doing it. Right. So it's, your, it's, it's your why. It's the why that you have why. that comes yeah. through. Right. And that's yeah. really the heart of all of our projects because we could all write cookbooks about salads, but they would be completely different. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so I think, you know, my my content is very personality forward. I have a real relationship with people. They feel that they feel like they're cooking with their girlfriends, like we're FaceTiming. And so I really, I lead with that and I don't shy away from it, but it, I mean, yeah, it was incredibly validating. And even when it came to big bites and launching the cookbook, I remember talking with my editor when we were discussing timing and January tends to be such a powerful month yeah. for my business and the content that I share. And she kind of said, okay, I'm just going to let you know that typically we don't suggest coming out with cookbooks that aren't diets, you know, because that's what we tend to do. And I said, that's exactly why I want to do it. Yeah. Right. Because We're do another I want to give yes. people something yeah. that doesn't exist. I want, I don't want to just add to the conversation. I want to change the conversation, right, right. the conversation. It, right. And so this January, having this new book out is mm -hmm. a perfect timing. How did you get yeah. to the cookbook space then? It sounds like it was always something yeah. that was in the back of your mind. You, it you was. loved the cookbooks, but how did it end up happening once it was time for that to happen? I had thought about doing a cookbook and I had been approached to do a cookbook a couple of times but I didn't, I didn't feel that I knew exactly what I wanted to say. I have, it's really out of such immense respect for the cookbook industry and the incredible chefs and, and cookbook authors that have come before me that I felt like if I wasn't really going to be offering something different, I didn't want to do a cookbook just to, to do a cookbook. So, and I'm so glad that I waited because only now is my my purpose and my differentiator of my brand so clear to me. Yeah. Uh, so really it was, I had been 
I was approached by one literary agent in particular. She emailed me and I had had a few email me casually, but this felt like the right time. And I loved her email. I loved how personal it was. It She picked up on certain things in my videos and intention that I didn't even say, but that she could just, it just felt like she got me mm-hmm. and we had a conversation and I knew right away, this is, this is the person yeah. for me. Yeah. And then you launched into book deal. Did you have to do a proposal? Yeah. Yes. So yes. we started a proposal right, yep. right away. Yeah. I'm, I'm somebody that I can get things done yep. quick. Right. Once um, you have a little direction and you know where mm-hmm. you're going with it. Yep. Yep. And the big bites notion really came out of, I, you know, I have sometimes I have a way where if I'm, you know, I'm eating on camera a lot, I, I eat and I live with a lot of gusto that may rub people the wrong way, especially, you know, people that think that certain manners should be upheld, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, whatever it is. And I'm quite casual about my approach. So I was like, it's kind of, funny because people will sometimes say, you know, I, the, my bites of food are too big and <laughs> truly, your mouth truly. is too full. Uh-huh. Yeah. Or I shouldn't, I oftentimes I'll eat a chopped salad with a spoon. And yeah. so I became kind of known for it's that. Like cereal. You get, you get a little <laughs> bit of everything in yes. one bite. So I was like, what if we did big bites? Because it is big food. It has big personality. It has, yes, it's big on nutrition, but it's got big flavors and it's big bites. Yeah. And it just felt very, it felt yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. And it really resonates with people. They love the idea. It's exciting. It feels liberating. Right. So one question I often get when people are heading into cookbook projects is, Okay, then how do you strike the balance between recipes that you're putting in your cookbook Mm. versus recipes that you're giving and sharing to the public, either through a food blog or social media? What's what kind of balance did you strike there? And how did you continue to be a recipe creator, create enough content for social media and for your book? It was challenging at certain times. I'll tell you that it was challenging because I would you know, I, I think because, because I had thought about doing a cookbook for a while, I had the advantage of having a number of recipes that I won't say that I was saving them, but I hadn't quite perfected, but I knew that it it was something that would be really impactful and really big. So I had kind of this whole arsenal that was not completely ready to go by any means, but I had a number of things and I tend to work ahead of time. So I would batch create a number of recipes and then just get them onto my computer. I would categorize them by season if I didn't get to them. And there are evergreen recipes that will be timeless. My food doesn't tend to be very trendy. It tends to be very classic with a modern twist. So in, I don't have to worry too much about jumping on the bandwagon of some fad. And if I don't get it on the website now, it's not going to be relevant next year. Yeah. Yeah. So then you could uh, be working on something. You could even store it away. You had it saved. I think it's important for people that are working on projects like this to hear what you said about you had a way of like saving it so you could find it again when the time came that you needed it. Yeah. It sounds like seasonality was maybe something that you looked at saving it or tagging it with very much. So yeah, I tend to cook very seasonally. That's yeah. something that you don't see me using much tomatoes right now or berries yeah. or anything yeah. like yeah. that. You just yeah. don't. Yeah. And yeah. I always think for cooks that want to try to have variety seasonal is really a great way to uh, approach that and looking at the seasonality, even within your, wherever you live, because even in the U S you know, there's so many like variations of that. Um, if yeah. you live in South Florida versus if you live in Connecticut, but, but there are general like little trends that um, carry over in food. And um, I love that you saved them and you worked on them, but you knew when the time came, you could find what you were working on and you could uh, utilize yes. it. Yeah. It still, ha- it still happens now where I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that recipe. That was really good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. because I, I come across it on, on my computer. I'm someone who writes everything down. If yeah. someone says to me, take a mental note of this, I'm like, no, 
I will not because this is very <laughs> precious real estate up right. here. Right. And I cannot be, because it's just, I run anxious naturally. I can't do that to myself. Is it, um, do you like digital down. notes or do you use notebooks, pen and paper? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's like to me the hardest. Paper. I know I me do. too, but that's the hardest thing for me is finding what I've written down and past it's notebooks. True. It's true. I put everything in my Google calendar, everything, everything, even 15 minute slots for different emails I need to send. But as far as just like quick things that I need to see, it all goes here. As far as recipe development and content ideas and that kind of thing, that all goes on my computer. Yeah. 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 So I just make the the separate folders for it, but yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's a lot. I think when you're a creative person, your mind is always going. So you've got to just get it out and get it down or else it'll. One of my favorite books about uh, writing is called Write for Life, written by Julia Cameron. Julia Cameron wrote the book mm. 25 years ago called The Artist's Way. And she oh, has, I've a, heard of it. She has a writing it. practice where she, every when she's, I think even when she's writing books, but when she's in between books, every morning she writes three longhand pages in a spiral notebook and she calls them her morning pages. But she felt like in between books, writing helps her clarify and order what's going on in her mind mm-hmm. <laughs> and in her life. I understand life. that. Yeah. So I, th- I understand that too. And I've always resonated with using writing, even if it's in a notebook or if it's digitally as a way to just like kind of clarify the stuff that's going on in our, in our, my brain. Yeah. So, make some sense of it. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about the book, Big Bites, mm. um, wholesome comforting recipes that are big on flavor, nourishment, and fun. And um, I would love to talk about a few of the recipes, um, things about the book that set it apart from other cookbooks. And um, mm-hmm. I'll kind of let you lead the way with the, uh, that conversation. And then maybe mention a few of the recipes that uh, might surprise people or things that you think are really uh, worth the, you know, getting the book to have this because those are the kinds of things that we love to share as cookbook authors. Sure, sure. Um, so I think for me, what I wanted with this book was I really wanted it to be, it's referred to as my flagship book, the book that people, as gorgeous as it is, I want people to make a mess of it. You know, I want this to be the kind of book that they have in their kitchen that they know they can turn to no matter what, if it's a Tuesday evening and they have 30 minutes to get dinner on the table, or if it's a snowy Sunday and they want to cook something low and slow, or if they're having a dinner party or it's a birthday, no matter what it is, there's going to be a recipe in here for you. And the way that it's structured, that's why when it comes to the dinner recipes, which I feel like dinner is just the Achilles heel yeah, for yeah. so many of us home cooks, even for myself. Yeah. I don't always love putting dinner on the table, but I need to do it. Yeah. So I have it split up into two different sections, weeknights and then Sunday supper. So one of them is more sort of project cooking, nothing crazy complicated, but stuff that takes a little bit longer, right? Yeah. Um, whether you're talking about a pot roast or The recipe that I think people are the most eager about is my gluten-free bread recipe. Nice. Tell us about that. It was the one recipe that I knew I was going to be saving for the cookbook because the title is three-year gluten-free bread. And it did take me three years to perfect it. I mean, thousands of tests. I mean, by the end, my husband was like, I'd be like, well, what do you think about that? He's like, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it, it, there's no difference from the last 50 loaves you made, you know? Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really something special. And I love a challenge and a girlfriend of mine who is now is at William Sonoma. We went to culinary school together. She joked with me when everybody was making, starting to bake bread during the pandemic. And I'm like, I'm going to come up with a gluten-free bread. And she's like, of course, like you would pick the hardest <laughs> kind of bread you could possibly make. Um, so again, like I'm always looking to problem solve for people and to give them different options. And it's a loaf that you can mix, you can bake, and you can eat all in the same day. So is, it isn't the kind of thing that you need to plan the day before. Yeah. Which I some think breads, you know, take, right. Take 48 yeah. hours. Right. 
Yeah. And it's a beautiful process if you have the time, but if you aren't always planning that far ahead and you wake up on a Sunday morning and you're like, I really want some bread tonight. You can do that. Yeah. Good. Sounds exciting. I love the title three year. It's very clear Mm -hmm. that this has taken a while to get here. Yeah. Here it is in this book, and that that makes it wonderful to be able to experience several of the salad, uh, the hungry lady salads in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's, I mean people would riot if I didn't have <laughs> hungry lady salads in there. So I did. That's the longest chapter. It's eighteen different hungry yeah. lady salads. Fifteen of them are brand new, yeah. um, and then a few of them are fan favorites. But that that was of course, a a very enjoyable chapter for me. Um, And a lot of it is recipes that will feel familiar to people in some ways, but just with unique modern takes on it, like the shaved Caesar salad with fennel and crispy chickpeas. Everyone loves the Caesar salad. It's one of those things that almost everyone loves, right? But the crispy chickpeas, the shaved fennel, a dressing that is creamy, but a bit lighter, has lots of flavor. It's just a different take on it. It's done the cat can cook way. Yeah. The barbecue ranch chop salad. Is that oh. one of the fan favorites or is that new for it's, the book? It's new and it's going to be. It looks good. Favorite. It looks good. Yep. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be a fan favorite. The Tex-Mex coleslaw will be a fan favorite. I know by now what people will yeah. really respond to. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. I can't wait. I um, always get hard copies sent to me for the purposes of this podcast. So it's just amazing that I get to mm. now sit down and read and cook out of these books. It's just, it's so, yeah. so I've got to try both of those and um, I can't wait. So um, what's up for your launch? So I'm going to be um, doing some tour. So I'm, I'm in Connecticut. I'm going to be doing some local events and then I'm going to be doing a bit of traveling yeah. throughout Rhode Island, New York, Boston, then Texas, and um, potentially a few more places. Um, We've been doing some media, Good Morning America, the Tamron Hall show. And just really, I just, you know, there's nothing like seeing the book in people's hands. Yeah, and you kind of come full circle then if you're now going back into big, big media, you know, to like Mm -hmm. promote this. Yes. How does that feel? I was just saying to my husband the other day, I, I, so I know what the producers are dealing with, you know? So when they're scrambling, asking me for photos, when I was 12 years old, you know, the night before the segment, I'm like, I totally get what they're dealing with right now. Everything's really last minute and, you know, just being on the other side of it. It's pretty cool. That's neat. Well, um, how can people connect with you then online? So you can find me at my website, KathleenAshmore.com. Um, and that's where all of the pre-orders are rounded. The pre-order links are rounded up, but I am Cat Can Cook on social media, Instagram, TikTok, all those fun places. Very good. Well, um, as a final question, I always love to talk a little bit of cookbooks with my mm. uh, people. And I know that you are a cookbook lover from the very beginning. So tell us a little bit about some of your favorite cookbooks or favorite cookbook and uh, Mm -hmm. why they appeal to you? I have, I have many, but I would say (laughs) Alice Waters is one of my favorite cookbook authors and recipe developers. Her approach to taking advantage of the world around us and seasonality and produce and really making, I'd say like really giving it main character energy. That is very much my approach as well. And so I've learned a lot from her in that regard. I think Adelangi's books are all gorgeous and beautiful. And I would say probably Melissa Clark is my favorite cookbook author to read. Her storytelling is really top notch and she's just a wonderful person. Great. Well, I'll link to those in the show notes. This good time for discovery sometimes for books for people listening so it's always fun to hear what you're reading as well well i wish you the best of luck with your book big bites um have a big time promoting it uh can't wait you said maybe there might be more books in the future huh that's the plan yeah yeah Yeah. have you started on any can you give us any sneak peeks i'm i'm are you ideating started i'm getting started on two as we speak sweet 
That's fun. Yeah. 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 Amazing. And uh, you know, it's so different uh, interacting with people on social media, but, you know, creating a tangible book is really um, something to be proud of. And so congratulations. Enjoy the journey of uh, launching, promoting, writing more. It's all very exciting. And um, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. Thank you. I loved being here. Yeah. Well, have a great day. Thank you. You as well. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. Again, all the links can be found in the show notes at www.cookbooklove.co. And if you are interested in writing a cookbook of your own, please check out the free cookbook writing masterclass called How to Get Paid to Write a Cookbook. It is designed specifically for food or nutrition experts. And you can check that out at www cookbookwritersacademy.com slash free. So that's it for today's episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. This is your host, Maggie Green. And until next time, have a great day and keep loving your cookbooks. Thanks for listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast. You can find out more information at www.cookbooklove.co. 